Well, hello there. I'm Carol Freeman of Hypnotic Nutrition, the creator of the 90 Day Keto Diet Challenge. I am so excited to be here today with Dr. Adam Nally of Doc Muscles fame. Doc Muscles, yes. Yeah, Welcome, well, Carol. yeah, I, out here, uh, St. Patrick's Day and surprise. It is St. Patrick's Day, isn't it? Yes. So I've been binge listening to you and Jimmy on your new uh, Keto Talk podcast, and I love it. Oh, no, um, wow. You guys are really, it's its really entertaining, really uh, educational as well. And what I'm most hoping that I get out of today is your little, like, Kermit Yoda voice that you're oh, no. using. <laughs> <laughs> you have been binge listening, haven't you? <laughs> it was only in the beginning, but not in, we miss, in the end, it's missing. So I think you got to bring G back Jimmy, the Jimmy doesn't right? like Jimmy doesn't like the Yoda character very much, but he'll sneak in once in a while. He sneaks in there, so. Well, it's like the voice of your... your your uh, patience is what it sounds like usually. Yes, it's, <laughs> well, there's a few little voices that pop out once in a while. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we'll all get lucky and we'll get to hear it today. So, um, okay. well, I'm just really curious about how did you end up being a doctor, anyways? Like, well, you know, I always loved science and I always loved um, um, computers. Um, thought, I thought originally I wanted to be a computer programmer, but then realized I liked the human body, I liked biology, I liked all those sort of things. They really brought um, a lot of fascination to me, and they actually kind of came easily. Okay. Um, and my family had a number of health issues over time, and and so oftentimes you find yourself searching for answers, and um, and that really came, became one of the issues uh, for me. Um, and and when, when when I was younger in high school, I remember talking to my father about you know what should I do when I grow up, Dad? And, and uh, he, this uh, he made a comment to me one day. He turned to me one day. He said, Adam, you can always set a bone for a chicken. So I thought, you know, no matter what ends up happening, as a doctor, you, you'll always have work. Set a bone and for a chicken. I've never heard that. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, you can always, you, you, there's always a need for a doctor. So I, I, I thought, well, I'll do that. And so I started pursuing medical school. Um, okay. I worked for uh, a, a, a group of sports medicine and orthopedic doctors initially before I got into medical school and found that I really liked that and thought I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon until I got into medical school and started training, and then realized how much I enjoyed training diabetes and blood pressure and um, you know, listening to heart sounds. And uh, Toward the end of my training uh, in, in medical school, uh, I was at an orthopedic surgeon's office and was walked in and one day he saw my stethoscope around my neck and he said, what's that? Because uh, orthopedic surgeons rarely listen to hearts. And I realized at that moment that I really wanted to to, to me, a doctor was, a, was someone who could take care of the whole body. Okay. Um, and in, in medicine today, we have, we're have we so so hyper-focused on what we do um, and so sub-specialized that I realized that family medicine gave me the broad spectrum to really cover cradle to the grave and really feel like a doctor, one of those old-time doctors. And so that's why I, I pursued family medicine. Um, to go further, you know, after practicing medicine for about five years, I ended up uh, realizing that what we were prescribing for patients with diabetes, prediabetes, and obesity wasn't working. Um, I, I, I had the same problem. My, my father uh, weighed almost 400 pounds when he died at 58. Of, um, okay. He ended up having multiple heart attacks. He had a quintuple bypass, and three of those were stented, and ended up having all the complications of diabetes, including um, renal failure and all the problems that went along with that. Wow. So I kind of watched him go down this process, this path, and realized my labs and my genetics were, were identical to his. And oh. everything we were doing wasn't working to solve that problem. And I had patients that would come into me and, you know, in tears saying, Dr. I cut my carbs or my, my calories down to a thousand and I'm, and I'm exercising, you know, every day for an hour, an hour and a half and I'm still gaining weight. Yeah. And they would literally bring in food journals, and exercise journals. Yeah. And I was doing the same thing. I was in the military at the time, exercising like crazy, cutting my calories down to 1200 per day and just having no success whatsoever. Um, it was 60 pounds heavier than I am today and just going, so we're doing something wrong. So I went looking for some way to learn how to treat this pattern of um, pre-diabetes and obesity that I saw really coming together as one piece and started seeing patterns in, in blood sugar, triglyceride, and um, the way people would change um, over a period of time and progress to diabetes in my practice in the first five years and started looking for answers and came across a couple of training programs that gave me those tools to uh, to go forward and that's where I, so I went, went on to do a fellowship in obesity medicine, um, got board certified in obesity medicine on top of family practice okay. and uh, for a period of time thought I wanted to treat obesity alone but realized obesity in my perspective, um, although it is a disease, it is it is also a symptom of a broader spectrum of, yeah. of an underlying disease that also causes the hypertension and the cholesterol and the, the gout and the 
the polycystic ovarian disease and all these other symptoms come with it. And I and felt like if I don't treat all that, I'm not really treating that whole person again. Uh, so okay. I so what I've done over the last 10 years um, is encompass or incorporated the treatment of weight and diet real heavily to the diseases of civilization, okay. essentially. So, so how long ago then was it that you kind of got that specialty that you were getting your board about certification? About 10 years ago. Okay. About 9 to 10 years ago. Okay. So, so I started that process and I got board certified about 8 years ago, but I started the process about 10. So I've been in practice about 15 years in total, um, and it was at about that 10-year mark where I realized, like, okay, we've got to do something different. We're not we're missing it. Well, so even then, carb restriction at you know ten years ago was probably really cutting edge or frowned upon. Or oh, that was yeah. that was the, that was horrible. Yeah, that was uh, that was uh, um, quackery back then. <laughs> okay, right. Considered. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. The, and that which is one of the challenges in looking and learning about carbohydrate restriction and ketogenic diets. And back then, we didn't even know what the word ketogenic meant. Yeah, it was right. it was low carb is right. what it was. Um, and at that point in time, high protein, because that's how the Atkins diet was interpreted, right. was a high protein diet. Uh, so looking at that perspective, and, and, and one, of the, one, of the, one of the things that helped me with my training was I realized if I'm going to ask people to make these changes, I have, to, I have to be an expert in the science. Because if I'm going to be telling the patient to do something opposite of what their cardiologist is telling them to do, yeah. I need to know exactly why I'm doing it, and I need to explain how it's going to work scientifically. Otherwise, I'll be seen as a quack across the board. So, so that was one of the things that I did, was look, look for um, the science and, and realize that this, we knew the science in this regard um, in the early 40s and 50s, right. yet we just couldn't ignore it. Mm -hmm. And so that was the, the whole point there, just was understanding that. Yeah, because so. we back up, you know, against that the low fat, the you know, fat and saturated fat causes heart disease. Exactly. Now, which, so we just have to ignore the other science that we know and. Exactly. Well, and and the challenge is that a lot of the science regarding saturated fat came from um, cholesterol studies by drug companies and things of that nature. So yeah. our our saturated fat approaches have been meted on a, on a false premise that fat is bad. Yeah. And you know, we we took this giant leap from 1960 to 1980. And assumed off of really bad science that yeah, saturated fat causes heart disease. Where it, there was this correlation, but there was no um, causation. Right. And that's the that's the bad science right. that we did in the, in the 70s and yeah. the 60s. So we're we're starting to get on the other side of that, but we've got a lot of mud mud waiting to get through before uh, everybody's going to be on the same page. So well, I look at it like a battleship. Okay, um, you know, if you've ever been in the military and you turn a battleship. Battleships don't turn very yep. quickly, or, right. or aircraft carriers. Right. Um, it takes a while to mm -hmm. turn them, and so um, we're we're just starting to, to turn the rudder, and we're starting to see the ship begin to turn. Yeah. But it's going to take a while until that ship turns around. That's an analogy I use with my clients a lot, with how small changes make really mm -hmm. big results over time, right? Yeah, like, exactly. It feels like a little thing now, but if you look over a year, that battleship's going to be in a totally different place than if exactly. you kept going on that same course. Yep, so. you just have to, you have to turn yeah. the ship. Yeah, exactly right. Yep. All right. Well, so. You are known on social media, pretty much every uh, avenue is Doc Muscles, right? That's so cool. So where, where does that, uh, that where does that come from? from? Yeah. Um, that comes from medical school okay. and how I got that. It's kind of an interesting uh, name. When I was in uh, medical school, one, I, in, our, in our medical school in, in Missouri, where I was at Kirkville, Missouri, um, they had a really um, strong program of of a mind, body, spirit type, okay. type approach, and and so we were actually given credit and encouraged healthy to to make exercise um, part of our lifestyle, and okay. which was actually really cool. I mean, I, I like that. So in the process of, of of making exercise part of the lifestyle, I would be at the gym at least you know, two or three times a week, and um, I enjoyed weightlifting a lot, uh, a lot more than the cardiovascular stuff, just because it was something that I found relax relaxing, and uh, so. Some of my buddies would, would just you know tease me, hey, your dog muscles, you know, uh, uh, dog muscles. There, and one of the one of the one of the trainers that was there would, would, would because I was one of the student doctors would see me and say, hey, dog muscles. And it just kind of stuck, and I, I didn't really pick that name. It just was one of those names that yeah. I was called by a couple of friends, and it just kind of stuck. And so when I was, uh, I think I was trying to pick a about ten or fifteen years, you know, ten or eleven years ago, when I was when I first discovered Twitter, somebody said, well, you have to have a handle, uh, and I thought. What am I name for that? <laughs> and the first thing that came to mind was, well, the only, the only nickname I've yeah. ever been given by anybody was Doc Muscle. So I used it on Twitter. Well, it was on Twitter. And I, I took it and then I and I added it to Facebook and I added it to Instagram and, yeah. and then to you know all the other websites. And it just kind of it just kind of naturally stuck. And so I've left it in 
it's, it's been a fun, fun, fun yeah. to handle. So well, it's easier to remember, really. It's easier to remember. People yeah. know Doc Muscles more than yeah. Doctor Nally. And then, and, and in fact, Jimmy, I think I was back um, when I first met Jimmy Moore, probably ten years ago. He was sitting behind me in a conference, and another doctor was sitting next to him, and this other doctor was learning about social media, and I overheard him. Because uh, I knew who Jimmy was, uh, because he was already fairly popular on social media, and uh, this person was trying to pick a pick a handle. And Jimmy says, "It has to be catchy. It has to be something to remember." And I'm comparing myself. Was mine catchy? <laughs> so, so that's that's one of those things that you know, yeah. I'm stuck. In that. Well, it works. Okay, I'm gonna stick with that. Uh, needless to know, ten years later, would I be you know a co-host with Jimmy on a podcast? Yeah. So it's well. So you've got the fun. stamp of approval for him on your catchy. At least the catchy name. Yeah. Yes, yes. He, he approved of that. Yeah. He approved of that. So it was good. That's that's cool. Um, oh, and I actually want to um, go back and talk about your osteopathic doctor, which yes. a lot of people don't really know what that is. I have experience with that. So I have a twenty-year-old son, but back when he was about three years old, um, he was having chronic ear infections. And um, I also had chronic ear infections, and so, you know, we just thought it was like a genetic deformity or whatever unique variation of our ear canals that we were just prone to that. And um, I, at that time, I, you know, even now, I'm still into, like, alternative and whole body medicine, and I was re really looking for another solution besides putting tubes in his ears, yeah. which is what they wanted to do. Yeah. And um, I don't even know... Probably at that time, it had to be some random forum that I found, like a suggestion of an osteopathic doctor being able to do some kind of a you know school yeah, manipulation or something. Yeah. I didn't know anything about it, but I'm like, I'll try it. We'll keep my son from being able to have you know having to have tubes in his ears. And I went for one session, and again, I had no idea what the guy was doing. I assumed he was going to like force his head in all kinds of positions, but it was just like this gentle little, you know, touched his head. And he's never had an ear infection since with one treatment. Nice. And I was like, I don't know what it was. It was amazing. Do you do any uh, I do. ear, I ear do. adjustments? I or do. Like? Um, the, the interesting thing about being an osteopath, and, and, well, let, me, and let me back up a little bit to, uh, to prior to going to medical school. Um, I originally wanted to go, you know, I'm, I, I'm from Arizona, so you know, the medical school in Arizona is the University of Arizona, and it's close by, and you know, the in-state tuition and all the cool things, it would have been nice that way. So as I was working um, with uh, one of the doctors I worked with while I was in college prior to medical school, um, a couple of them were MDs and a couple of them were DOs, and I didn't know the difference mm -hmm. between the two. Uh, and I remember um, I had been in a car accident and uh, was rear-ended and was was actually at a stop sign looking over my shoulder and when I got hit, you know, the car hit me. And so for about two weeks, I felt like there was this spot in my back that I couldn't take a full breath. Every time I tried to take a full breath, it would pinch and it wouldn't, it was, it was killing me. So I'm standing at the copy machine in front of one of the doctors that I worked for in, in his office copying off stuff. And uh, he had a medical student with him walking by and he said, Adam, how are you doing? I said, well, I'm okay. But I, I said, can I ask you a question? And he goes, yeah. I said, I have this car accident and I can't take a full breath. I mean, I feel fine otherwise, but every time I take it, I said it hurts. And so he kind of ran his thumb down my back and goes right there and he pushed. I went, yeah. He says, well, come here. So he takes me around the corner into one of the exam rooms and he twists me up, up like a pretzel. And, and uh, the medical student was watching him and he, he you know, does this. He puts me into this one position and a little, just a little subtle maneuver and there's this pop. And I went, ah. I could take a breath. And to me, it was magic. It was just this magic. And I, I, I at that moment, I realized, I want to know how to do that. Yeah. That's really cool. Uh, you know, you can immediate relief from, and I said, well, what's, what, was, what was wrong? And he said, well, your rib was out of place. Yeah. And I went, your rib was out of place? <laughs> uh, so that was what spurred me on to wanting to understand what was. Okay. Um, was. You know, he had this technique of this ability to manipulate. Uh, I went to Kirksville, uh, which is the original Austin school. And the, the, the difference is, essentially, I tell people, you know, um, the chiropractors learned, the, the first chiropractor and the first osteopath were actually at Kirksville together. And the first osteopath, who was an MD, um, developed a pattern. He was a, a he was a, a surgeon in the Civil War, and but was very very good at setting bones and chicken bones too. Chicken bones too. <laughs> in fact, he would carry around bones with him and play with oh, the wow. motion of these bones. Okay. Uh, his name was A.T. Still. Anyway, he to make a long story short, uh, developed a number of patterns. This was prior to the advent of penicillin and, and antibiotics. Was, was so effective at, at manipulating bones that people would come to him and he would do these manipulative techniques and actually improve their, their uh, outcomes from flu and things of that nature. Oh, so wow. he became quite, quite famous in that area. Well, um, the original, uh, one of, uh, uh, another physician came to him and trained with him and they, they, they 
studied this pattern together. And about six months into the process, the one disagreed went north and opened the first school for chiropractic medicine. Oh, and the disagreement okay, was okay. the the chiropractor, uh, Doctor Paul, uh, I think it was, uh, um, I just slipped on the um, Palmer, Doctor Palmer, felt that ninety five percent of the disease could be cured with manipulation, yeah. and AT still said, no, it's just a tool. Okay. Um, okay. And so they, they parted ways with those different philosophies. Ah, okay. So the first school of chiropractic medicine started with manipulation as its sole treatment. Yeah. And the osteopathic schools went forward using manipulation as a component of treatment. Ah, okay. And then about two years later, penicillin was invented. Okay. And uh, so hence you, and then, you know, then we took off using medication as a medicinal approach. The, the osteopaths, though, um, uh, were told in order to get funding from the federal government, they had to drop the osteopathic component mm -hmm. and just follow the Hopkins model, okay. which was more medicinal and that we, we now call allopathic. Okay. Uh, so, so the, but the osteopath said, no, this works so well, we're yeah. going to keep it. So uh, all the osteopathic schools across the country are privately funded and have no government funding. Oh, okay. And they and in doing so, they maintain their, their osteopathic philosophy and that, that hands-on really of training. Oh, okay. So it's just another tool to develop. It basically, you know, we, we look at the body as a, a um, a, a summation of holes, mm -hmm. each part contributing to the whole. And yeah. if one of those parts is not working correctly functionally, it can affect everything else. And so yeah. that's one of the that's the basic premise of okay. philosophy medicine. It's a long way to answer. Yeah, well, that's great because I was gonna I was gonna ask how it related to chiropractic, but you just led right into so that. yeah, just yeah, that, that's the natural. natural. And so you know what? So basically, when people ask, well, what did you do? I said, well, I went to I, I mean, my medical school had summer school, and we learned to do manipulation okay. uh, in summer school. So I'm, I'm basically. Most people understand chiropractic more than they do osteopathic medicine. Mm -hmm. I'm an MD with you know the, the training to be able to do the same thing with chiropractic medicine. Okay, so, essentially. Sounds like you're you're better than both then. It's it's kind of a, it's kind of a meshing of both worlds. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's actually fun. Nice. Great. And it's it's one of those things again where you know somebody walks out of your office and already feels good when, when you've trained. Yeah. So they walk yeah. out going, I feel better than when I walked in. That feels yeah. That feels yeah. really good. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, um, I you know have some controversial topics. Oh, we, fun! It wouldn't be keto chat There's if uh, always, we didn't always have some controversial topics. So exactly. I want to ask you about your take on or your opinion on calories. Do calories matter when you're following a ketogenic diet? Because we've got you know we've got two ends of the spectrum. You'll find people that say that that calories absolutely matter. That uh, the only reason that keto helps with weight loss is the fact that it just reduces your appetite and you eat less. And so it's a calorie restriction in a comfortable way. And then I see the other end of the spectrum is that, no, as long as you're in ketosis, there's no way for your body to store any fat at all whatsoever. And so therefore, calories don't matter at all. And I, I've literally seen both of those arguments on the internet. And and they're probably going to exist on the internet for years because <laughs> that's just how the, how the internet works. Yeah. Um, I initially wondered the same thing, um, and when I first started doing low carbohydrate diets, I did it on myself first. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, I had struggled uh, restricting calories and had no effect whatsoever in restricting calories. So I, I dropped my calories to a thousand a day and was exercising an hour a day and two hours on the weekends running triathlons and not losing weight, wow. actually gaining fat. Yeah. My middle was getting bigger. Uh, and, and so from that perspective, I recognized that the calorie was not the issue. Mm -hmm. When I learned about low carbohydrate diets, I started studying how to apply them, and I went through Dr. Adkins' information and got trained by Eric Westman and, and a number of the other um, low carb um, gurus in the world, mm -hmm. uh, and then you know picked their brains and went through what they do. Um, start. I realized that, and as you read the science, you recognize that the human body is not a bomb calorimeter. Um, you know, in medical school, you study how many calories it takes to burn, you know, a glass of water or a, a piece of bread, yeah. and they put that piece of bread into what's called a bomb calorimeter, and they heat it up to a certain temperature to destroy it. Well, the amount of heat that you put in there to destroy it is what is what a calorie is. Um, well, the human body is different because if I eat a piece of bread and you eat a piece of bread, we're going to process this totally differently depending on our hormones. And so I came to realize that our calories that we retain, or our, our, let me put it back, our, the weight that we either lose or gain is driven by a hormone, not by a calorie. Yeah. I tested that on myself because I heard the same thing. Well, if you're just eating low carb, you're just eating less calories. Well, you know, I told you I was eating a thousand calories a day. Well, my dietary change yeah. shifted to eating a pound of sausage and three eggs cooked in butter every morning. And I lost... 55, 60 pounds. So you probably like triple months. or quadruple my, your calories. I added up my calories and I was eating five to six thousand calories a day, where before I was only eating a thousand. And I actually lost weight. Um, and I stopped exercising. 
I stopped exercising and increased my calories to somewhere between three and 6,000 a day and lost weight. And so, you know, the argument that, oh, it's all calories is actually false. It's absolutely false. Now, does the calorie pl play a role? There's still some argument, you know, when people begin to plateau, if there's a calorie issue there. Uh, and when I help people calculate their protein contents, we use calories as a marker. But to be honest, today, I don't, in my practice, in the, in the 10 years that I've been doing ketogenic diets, the calories play no role. Okay. Is, it is all hormonal. Okay. Now, is, I, may, I may eat my words later, but, but to be honest <laughs> with you, in 10 years of my practice and what I've been doing in my office, it's not calories, it's hormones. Um, so do you, do you ever run into the people then that maybe, you know, on the addiction spectrum that have maybe a food addiction where they just, even on a low carb diet, that they're still just eating in such volumes that that prevents them from losing weight or is it always an underlying hormonal issue that you found? In the 10 years that I've been doing it, it's always an underlying okay. hormonal, hormonal, okay. horm hormonal issue. It really is. I mean, if you, and I tell patients this, I say, I, I tell them this, you know, if I turned to my wife one, one, one month and said, honey, just concentrate really hard and don't have your period. <laughs> um, that ain't happening. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, and no matter how hard you know, she concentrates, yeah. that's not going to happen. Willpower. Just use your willpower. Just use your willpower. Yeah. And I had an endocrinologist tell me, just push away from the table and you'll lose weight. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's like telling my wife, honey, just yeah. concentrate really hard. Don't have your period. Periods are hormonal. Right. Weight gain right. is hormonal. Okay. The, the, and, and it's, it's that powerful. So yeah. for someone to take, um, for someone to tell me that, that, you know, just changing my calories, uh, is going to change a hormone function mm -hmm. is absolutely false. You know, your body and my body respond so powerfully to the hormones, um, it was, I should say so powerfully hormonally to certain food types. Mm -hmm. That's what drives that process. Yeah. And now those people that have food addictions, there's often other underlying hormone or psychological issues that they are receiving, a, you know, some form of either metabolic or psychological re reward for what they do. Right. Everything we do has a reason. We do it for a reason. Whether it's a negative reward or a positive reward, we do it with, from the addiction side. There's a, either a hormonal reward or a psychological reward from what we do. And you, when you finally tease it out, I mean, in the 10 years that I've been doing low-carb ketogenic diets, I have never seen a calorie issue. Oh, okay. It's always it's really, a hormone issue. It probably makes people really excited to think that... And that's what my clients share with me is the best thing for them about <clears throat> keto compared to every other diet because they've all tried every diet out there is they're like, you told me I wasn't going to be hungry. I didn't believe you, but... You know, I have a meal and I can't even eat half of it because I'm I'm You're so full. satisfied and full. And, full. Yeah. Yeah. And, now there was there was a period of time um, where you know we just cut out carbs and and we thought the protein and fat were fine and we right, ate all the right. protein that we did. Right. And initially, like I said, I was eating a pound of sausage and three eggs, and so my protein content was actually quite heavy. Um, but in comparison to the hormone stimulus to store fat, the switch turned that off, and so I lost weight. And so then about 30 pounds or so, my weight started to plateau out, and I'm going, well, what's the deal here? And then as in talking to number two, I said, well, maybe it is the calories. Well, for a while, I thought, well, maybe it's maybe you know, 3,000 calories is too much. Yeah. Um, but when you really re realize that it's not the calories, the protein itself yeah. plays a hormonal right. role also. And when you start to modulate the protein and understand its hormone response and modulate it, that's where we start to realize that hey, this is a key agenda. It's high fat, moderate protein, low carb. Right. Because that moderation of protein also plays a role in, in the hormone response. Uh, and, the, and the people that don't understand that protein, they're the ones that are always saying, what is it? It is the calories. And there's, oh, the, there's the voice. There's the voice, Jay. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, they, they, they're the ones that are usually saying, oh, yeah, it's calories. And, and I go, no, it's just the protein. Yeah. And when, yeah. You, when you fix the protein and you understand that protein has just as powerful a stimulus as carbohydrate mm -hmm. does, then you all of a sudden switch the other hormone component and the weight starts to fall off. Yeah. And I find that's the biggest myth or misunderstanding mm -hmm. about keto is that people think it's a high protein diet um, or they think it's just like Atkins. Well, I, I, I do Atkins, so I'm doing a keto diet. It's like, well, that's the biggest difference is that uh, protein is not moderated on Atkins, it's, it's kind of a free food, have as much as you like, have a 20 ounce quarter steak if you want. Um, whereas on keto, we actually have a moderate protein. And I would say compared to most people in the United States, we probably eat less protein than what the average person eats. Possibly, yeah. Well, and if you look, if you actually look at, at Atkins, he, he, Dr. Atkins actually limited cheese. And okay. cheese has protein. Yeah. And so, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of what I find when I'm eating is, is I'll use cheese as my fat 
component adding fat, but I'm also adding protein when I'm adding cheese too. Mm, right. So so with Dr. Atkins, he would limit cheese. And that was somewhat a, a moderating of the protein there. Yeah. A lot of people when they're eating red meat or pork, you know, the fat is so filling. Yeah. They won't overdo the protein amounts mm. when they eat pork or, or red meat, but they will when they eat cheese. Yeah. And I think yeah. that I, I think if Dr. Atkins was live, that would be my first question I had asked him is why did you have them moderate cheese? Mm -hmm. And I think his answer is because there's protein in that cheese. Mm -hmm. And that would that, that and that's what they were moderating. Now whether he understood that then as protein or whether they understood at that point in time as a calorie, okay. I'd only answer that. Yeah. Um, but I, but that's what I found is that it's really the protein as the next step. Mm -hmm. And I have many patients that, you know, to get, and I, I've found that for people, this is a lifestyle change. And it takes yeah. two or three months to understand how do I cut out carbs and eat more fat. Mm -hmm. And then they get to a point where they're, they've, they've figured out how to do that. And then they got to figure out, okay, well, how do I moderate protein? Right. And I just take them in stepwise process. Okay. We start with carbs first, then we go to protein. And then we, and then we look at, you know, you know uh, the, the timing of other foods and things like that if necessary. Yeah. But that's really how I do it. And okay. I find that seems to be the most effective method. Because people do well when they take one step at a time. If you give it all to them once, they get so confused. Because half right. the people you talk to don't even know what carb is. Right, right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, you get the protein box at Starbucks, which has like the bagel and exactly. the apple and yeah. all the grapes in it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's not, that's not <laughs> like protein. protein right? exactly. yeah. 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 Well, so you, you talk about the, the stepwise approach that you take with walking people through, and it does take time to adapt, <laughs> and that kind of leads me into the, the uh, physiological adaptation that we go through as far as our digestion. So, you know, one part of that is your body adjusting to digesting fat, but I wanted to talk to you about your take on, you know, the probiotics and our whole gut biome that adjusts through this process because, um, you know, I was somebody that experienced, um, you know, talking to a doctor here, I can share, you know, I had pretty severe diarrhea for quite a while and my own research online led me to believe that probably was a lot of bacterial die off mm -hmm. from, I had carb overload bacteria in me. And so I just went with it. I'm like, this is good. I need to get rid of this stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, but you know, I understand it's kind of a you know a not very well studied area, and it's controversial. Should we have probiotics if we're on a ketogenic diet? Should we? What strains should we have? Do we need to worry about supplementing with the forms like the the acidophilus that um, you know or you know that are de carb dependent? Do we yeah. need those? What? So what? Uh, that was a very rambling question, but. Um, What's your take on you know probiotics? Do you recommend those for your clients? Well, your patients. The, I think it's important to back up first and, and understand that the the the, the human genome and the um, the gut bio, bio, yeah. bio the, the, the the housing of where our, the, our gut bacteria live is a is a new field. It's a field that's not right. really well right. understood. We understand a very little bit about. Uh, something that's very, very expansive and, and maybe very difficult to, to grasp even in the next few years. Um, but we have enough data to, to recognize that it's, it plays a significant role. Um, and if you don't address it in some patients, um, you won't see solutions to their to their weight and to some of their physical health issues because that does play a very large role. Um, with that being said, recognizing that, the first thing that's important to recognize is that um, when you eat the SAD diet or the standard American diet, mm -hmm. um, it does change, and the data shows us initially that 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 the gut biome changes, that the bacteria in the gut shift, mm -hmm. and they shift from one uh, three or four strains to, to a, a, a second three or four strains. Uh, where you know if you if you take a uh, number of studies have shown that when you take twins uh, that were that were, were identical, and you put one on the American diet, you put one on another diet. Um, over a period of years, you will see dramatic changes in their gut. Yeah. And then when you switch it, the, the, that bacteria will actually change to the opposite, it will flow back. So what that tells us is that what we eat, the environment that we're in does play a role in our, in our gut bacteria. Mm -hmm. Knowing that our gut bacteria plays a role in hormones, mm -hmm. um, plays a big role in our ability to gain, gain or lose weight. Now, from the perspective of a low fat world, um, when you take fat out of the diet, you remove a whole bunch of important nutrients. And the only way to find those nutrients is to either get them in the form of vegetables and fruits or supplement them in their, our garbage that we eat, um, or uh, take a probiotic. And the challenge with a low-fat, high-carb diet is it's extremely constipating. So you have to add a ton of fiber. Yeah. Well, that excess fiber and the lack of those those bacteria will can and will often shift that bacterial change. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge is we don't really know what the perfect balance for right. the gut is because 
since we've been studying this, we've only seen standard American diets. And, and there's no perfect, we, we, we've not been able to go back to the caveman and biopsy his belly and, and know, you know what, what, yeah. did, what, what, was that, what was his gut bio makeup. <laughs> um, it'd be nice, we don't have yeah. it. So the challenge is, well, what's the correct one? Well, what's interesting to find out is that people that feel the healthiest have a certain balance of anywhere between 17 and 23 as far as I read different bacteria, gut bacteria, and there's argument still, and that's yeah. still very, very cutting edge, and we don't know all the answers there. Um, but what's really fascinating to find out is that in order to balance the small intestine, the upper gut, mm -hmm. you need saturated fat, and a, a low carbohydrate diet provides that. In order to balance the bottom end of the gut, the low, the colon, um, you need leafy green vegetables. Okay. Um, you don't need potatoes, you don't need carrots, you don't need, you don't need leafy greens. Well, what does the low carb QJ diet provide? Yeah. Saturated fat, leafy green vegetables. Um, now, the leafy greens are not there so much for its fiber as they are for the phytonutrients and the ability for um, the, the bacteria to create uh, fermentation processes mm -hmm. like that. So, so adding in, so you're going to hear a lot of low carb people talk about kombucha and, and you know, uh, fermented foods and things of that nature. Well, you know, cabbage is a leafy green and when you ferment it, it turns into sauerkraut. Well, right. you know, you eat your hot dog and sauerkraut and you've essentially got a perfect meal for a low carb diet, yeah. which yeah. provides for the, the nutrients necessary for, for a lot of those bacteria to grow. Now, for some patients that have wiped out their bacteria either because of antibiotics or illness or things of that nature, we will add on some probiotics as kind of a kickstart. Okay. But we'll also encourage them to use certain types of foods that may help provide the, you know, for bacteria to grow, if you ever took your biology class, in order for bacteria to grow, you have to provide a substance for it to grow on. Mm -hmm. Well, certain bacteria need certain substances. Um, one of those are f the certain fermenting components, and the leafy greens provide that for the lower gut, and saturated fat, and its effect, some of the studies that recently come out, um, are what are needed for the upper part of the gut. Mm -hmm. And so we're finding that that's, that's really what we're in need of. And, and so do I offer probiotics for patients? I do at times, yes. Okay. And I carry probiotics, and there are different types. You know, the types, the kind you can buy over the counter, which is the acidophilus, um, that's the that's the that's the bacteria that's going to help you convert lactose. Well, if you've already taken the lactose out, acidophilus is not horribly yeah. important. Yeah. But there are five or eight strains that are important, and but those strains have to come from certain cultures and they have to be refrigerated. Yeah. And so those are those are a little more expensive yeah. probiotics, and those are things you probably want to talk to your doctor about uh, to get them that way. Um, so yeah. do you need to start with a probiotic? Are they bad? No, they're not bad. Okay. Is it going to help you to use one? Probably, um, but you don't have to. So, you know, I mean, we've been living for thousands of years about probiotics right. and we've fine. Yeah, well, um, before we had all the antibacterial hand soap. Exactly, yeah. exactly <laughs> right. So, so, you know, so if you're one that's gone through a process where you've had your gut bacteria wiped out because of multiple rounds of antibiotics and mm -hmm. various things like that, then you might benefit very much from one. Um, but, uh, and, and we're learning more about, you know, which ones do you need? And, yeah. and sometimes just taking cultures and doing some stool studies help us a great deal in understanding which cultures may be shifting that way. Yeah. Um, and there are, so there are some stool tests and blood tests that can be done for that. Um, but those are things you want to do with your doctor. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's kind of a roundabout answer. Really. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I come from Bastyr University, Seattle area, where, you know, as students, we shared kombucha scobies, we made sauerkraut, we took classes on all of that. So we, uh, we know a lot about You know a lot about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and, and to be honest, you know, there are a lot of people that know a lot more about that aspect than I do. But the interesting thing I've found is that using a ketogenic diet, I've really not had to do a lot of it. Mm -hmm. It's not been a huge factor for a lot of patients. Yeah. Because when they change their diet, the body, the amazing thing about this body that we have is it, it it's self-healing. You know, it yeah. heals itself. Yeah. And so if you provide the, the nutrients that it needs, it will do everything in its power to, to shift that back. Yeah. Uh, now we can give it a push here and a push there. And, I, and in my mind, that's what prebiotics and probiotics are. They're kind of giving the body a little push. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, aspect medicine, you know, manipulation is just I'm giving the body a little push yeah. right here. That's what I'm doing. And it, just, it, it, it really is. Yeah. It's a little push in a certain area to shift yeah. some of that functionality yeah. a little faster down the road. Yeah. That's what we're doing. So. Yeah. Well, and so along those lines of, you mentioned, uh, you know, different people having different gut biome, um, you know, the, one of the things I loved in listening to all your podcasts was your theme of bio-individuality and that, uh, you know, keto diet can be beneficial to pretty much everybody. However, not everybody necessarily needs that. And we all have a different carb tolerance level and, um, um, what's a question about that that I've got that I need to ask a question about that, don't I? Um, well, so what are, um, 
you probably see people that are all on the end of the spectrum that they're very carb sensitive. Um, I, I see both actually. Okay. I know I have athletes that come in the office. I have, I have weightlifters. I have a couple bodybuilders. You know, I got some 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 athletes that come to the office. Then I got patients that are really really sick. Okay. And you know, on the on the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, and so that was a question that I had for a while. Is you know, if I start doing this low carb thing, yeah. does is this should I shift everybody to this low carb yeah. thing? Yeah. What was do they really need it? You know. I saw about a fourth or a third of the population actually did pretty well with low calorie. Okay. They actually did okay. Um, low fat, you mean? Low fat. Okay. Yeah. So now low, low calorie. calorie. Okay. Well, okay. and 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 they would actually cut their calories down okay. to about one twenty, and they would lower the fat in that process. Low okay. calorie and low, and low fat is what they were doing. Okay. They were lowering the fat and lowering the calories. But what often they were doing was they were also cutting out simple sugars yeah. in the process. Now we didn't say that, but that's what, what they were doing. Um, and I saw some some of those patients actually did okay, but their cholesterol never improved, okay. and their gout never went away. In fact, it often got worse. Mm -hmm. um, or I saw their polycystic ovarian disease never improved. Mm -hmm. you know, they lost a little weight, and they felt kind of better, but these other diseases of civilization, their blood pressure went up, yeah. and so that actually never improved. Okay. What I ended up finding is that when I started doing degrees of, ins of, of carb restriction, patients' yeah. cholesterols got better, their blood pressure got better, their gout got better, their testosterone and their polycystic ovarian issues got better. I sort of seen this happen. And it, sort of, and it correlated fairly closely with their degree of insulin resistance. Okay. Now, I started doing something 10 years ago because I saw it as a pattern that really didn't get identified until five or four years ago in literature. And that was this term we call insulin resistance. Yeah. And what that basically means is if you give me a piece of bread, I'm going to produce a certain amount of insulin response to that piece of bread. It should be a size worth, but for me, because I'm so insulin resistant, yeah. I'll produce 10 times the insulin mm -hmm. response to that bread. It's as if I eat the whole loaf. And um, now if I give you a piece of bread or my wife a piece of bread, you may produce only twice the insulin or, one, or, or, the, or the normal amount of insulin. And so people that come into my office have varying degrees of insulin resistance. And that's genetic. Now, I don't think it's a disease. It's a, we call it a syndrome, but it's because a syndrome is a conglomeration of different symptoms, but it's not always a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and, in, I, and I see it as a, a means whereby the, that person genetically could survive a famine. Um, you know, if it, we used to eat, we used to not have refrigerators. And so during the summertime, we'd eat our carbs, and in the wintertime, we'd eat more proteins and fats and a little bit of stored carbs we had. Mm -hmm. But that insulin resistance mm -hmm. and that response of insulin and fat storage is what allowed a lot of people to survive a, a bad winter or yeah. a bad famine. Yeah. And so um, our degree we're survivors. We're survivors. Yeah. Yes, we are. I, I, I tell people, you know, I have a perfect U Haul storage center for fat. So, <laughs> and so genetically, I'm, I'm great. It's fantastic. And some of my patients are too. Um, and so when these patients come in in tears, you know, Dr. Yeah. I, I just tell them, hey, when the famine comes, you and I are going to be alive. Yeah. We're going to be okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's the low fat people that have a problem. <laughs> I'm worried about them. Um, so that's one of the challenges that I find. So, and, and what I realized, and again, this is the world according to Adam, based on what I see clinically, is that genetically we all respond slightly differently to that insulin. Mm -hmm. And depending on how we respond, we can increase or decrease the carb restriction and actually see improvement in those diseases of civilization. Yeah. So a lot of patients that come in don't need to lose weight, but they do need to improve their blood pressure, yeah. they do need to improve their cholesterol, they need to improve their gout, they have other endocrinologic diseases that are related or interrelated to that insulin component. And when we modulate that insulin down mm -hmm. and we help that, those get better, those improve dramatically. So can everybody benefit? Yes. Does everybody need it? Yeah. Probably not. Um, but, but what I see is is that you know we're all individuals. Yeah. Um, that it was a movie or something, but um, <laughs> we our individuality um, allows us to tailor our diet to to, to have an outcome. Okay. And so when people, someone comes and sees me, I'm trying to treat either blood pressure issue or cholesterol issue or weight issue or all of the above. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to modulate their carb restriction based on that. Okay. So will everybody be, everybody be ketogenic like I am? No, they won't. But will they have some degree of carb restriction? I'm probably going to recommend it. Okay. Based on what I see clinically in their other uh, disease processes that arise. Yeah. These are long winded answers. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a great topic of discussion. So, yeah. um, so oh gosh, and I was so in listening to what you said, I lost the question that I had. Um, <laughs> um, uh, oh, oh, okay. So, one of the things that even people that I went to school with when they heard that I was doing a ketogenic diet, they warned me that, like, you're going to ruin your metabolism. Um, you'll never be able to 
eat normal again, which they just don't even understand how, what, you know, how. <laughs> of course you can't go back to eating the crap that you're eating before, like, this doesn't inoculate you from all that. But, um, so do you find though that after people have been, you know, carb restricted for a while that they gain a little bit of insulin sensitivity back that they might be able to tolerate a slightly higher carbohydrate <coughs> intake? Or once they find that perfect level for them, is that going to be something they probably have to maintain the rest of their life? Yes and yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> let me explain that. Um, I, I see on average, again, this is what I see clinically, and there's no data on this other than the, yeah. the pattern, you know, you know, watching patterns in my office. Um, the pattern I see is that it takes about 18 to 24 months for someone to see improvement in their insulin resistance. Okay. Um, I've got actually about five patients in my practice uh, that I can think of offhand that used to be diabetic and no longer are. Okay. And they're no longer diabetic based on the definition of diabetes. I mean, if I check their blood sugar when they're fasting, they're under 100. If I do a two hour glucose tolerance test on them, their blood sugars are now normal. Their A1C is now within the normal range of 5.6% or less. Mm -hmm. um, they, don't, they no longer have the signs and symptoms of diabetes. Now, genetically, they're always going to be insulin resistant. Mm -hmm. That will never go away. But that, that sensitivity got better. Okay. It actually got dramatically better in, in, in these five or six people um, in, in that regard, but it takes two, up to two years okay. to see that change. Now, I'm one of those, I've been doing you know, low carbon ketogenic diets for, for 10 years. I'm sl slightly less insulin sensitive, but <laughs> if, I, you know, if I do more than 20 or 30 grams, I feel it, I know it, I can uh, tell. Okay. And, and so I've just you know, resulted in the fact that I'm a, I'm, this is a lifestyle I have to live. And yeah. I, and, but I like this lifestyle, this yeah. me. Um, and I enjoy it, uh, but it's something I, I, I can do the rest of my life, and I'm comfortable doing the rest of my life. Now, there are a few patients, and my wife is one of them, just, if you took away bread, she would probably die, uh, <laughs> and she loves bread. And oh my gosh, you just did a commercial, right? I just did, you exactly. Love bread. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if she, if she so, so the, the, bread, the bread challenge is one for her, yeah. but what she's found is that she's, as she's been doing low carb diets, she's been able to tolerate bread without the symptoms she used to get when okay. she had bread before. So, homemade sourdough, for example? Or, or well, she yeah. makes a homemade whole wheat bread that's okay. actually fantastic, okay. but I can't eat it very, you know, very often. <laughs> You've um, heard it's fantastic. Right? Uh, no, I know it's fantastic. Oh, okay. that's, that's why I was 60 pounds every day. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the, uh, what I find is, in general, people's insulin sensitivity does get better. Okay. But it takes 18 to 24 months. All right. To, to, and to for some better. people, it's a small amount. And yeah, for some it's okay. small, and for others, it's, it's pretty dramatic to okay. where it literally changes their diabetes yeah, and reverses okay. it. So. But they probably can't ever go back to the really high carb diet that they were on. Before. The standard American diet, yeah. no. Yeah. They'll, okay. they'll, 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 you know, and that's one of the things I've seen is I've you know have patients that have come in and they've, they've done great. They've lost. You know, I have one guy that lost eighty pounds, did fantastic, dramatically improved his his uh, uh, blood pressure. And then he he went out of the country for two years and, oh. and was doing some mission service, and then came back and fell off the wagon and you know gained his eighty pounds back and was back oh. right to where he was before. Yeah. Yeah. And so you know if you if you let the diet change back and you follow that that high carb high fat um, approach, you'll mm -hmm. actually see the shift return. Yeah. So, unfortunately. So, yeah, so it's true, you're stuck with it forever. It's yeah. genetic, that's the, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's, it's a, it's a yeah. genetic issue. Yeah, um, So, the last thing I want to ask you about is, so I have a couple of clients that, when I asked them, you know, why do, what questions do you have for Dr. Muscles, Dr. Okay. Nally, um, really the, the issue of leptin for them. So, I know you have a great blog post about that it's pretty technical though maybe it's for technical. some you know yeah. uh, the average person that maybe doesn't understand biochemistry and all that but so I have a couple of um, my patient clients that you know have been tested high leptin leptin resistance um, the whole the whole um, the biochemistry of that kind of it fascinates me but it also kind of puzzles me because um, it seems like there's kind of some holes in the theory a little bit as far as like if you lose weight, wouldn't it seem like, you know, shouldn't I be starving all the time? Because if, if I lost weight quickly, my leptin would be low, low, it would be, yeah, it would be low. And so then the signal, my brain's not getting the leptin signal anymore. So I should just be ravenous, right? I mean, so there's more to that. So if you look at leptin from the, the model of a calorie issue, yes. Okay. But we're, but you, but, and that's where, that's where we, that's where a lot of people miss the boat, I yeah. think. Is so maybe I should reset though for the people that don't know what leptin mm -hmm. is. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a hormone. That it's a hormone. Role so, 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 so if you ask me, the most powerful hormone in controlling weight gain is, is insulin. Okay. Insulin drives your weight gain. If you have, the more insulin you have, the more weight you gain, period. 
and the insulin lasts for about 12 hours. So if you give me that piece of bread and I produce enough insulin as if I ate an entire loaf, I'm going to store fat as if I ate the whole loaf for 12 hours. Okay. And that's what happens to me. Leptin is kind of the counter hormone. And leptin is not produced by the pancreas like insulin is. Leptin is produced by the fat cells. So the fat cells, um, among the 177 or 176 hormones that the fat cells actually make, fat cells being the largest endocrine gland in the body, the most powerful hormone in regards to satiety or, or hunger is leptin. So leptin, leptin is the driving hormone that tells you, hey, I'm full. Mm -hmm. And it's the one that really does help that satiation signal. But, and it's produced by the fat cells. So if you eat a big meal and your body starts putting fat in the fat cells, after a period of time, the fat cells go, okay, we're done. And it sends a signal of leptin to the brain to say, okay, stop eating. The, theoretically, if you stop sending fat to the fat cells, yeah. this, the leptin is going to lower and your hunger is going to go up. And that's where a lot of people say, well, you should, keep, you should be hungry. And that's where a lot of people like, right now, even today, think that the set point of weight, you know, you lose a certain point of weight and you plateau out, um, and the hunger comes back is that is that of leptin. Okay. Well, we fully don't understand leptin yet. Yeah. We don't totally know what stimulates leptin. We know what it does in a number of areas, but we also know leptin actually has got like at least 15 or 20 different receptor sites throughout the body. Oh, um, okay. A lot of them in the brain, and it actually regulates a lot of other things other than just satiety. Okay. So leptin has some other stuff that we still don't understand, or it does some things that we still don't understand. The cool thing about leptin, though, is that that leptin um, is a signal on whether this fat cell is healthy or sick. Okay. So I look at leptin in two ways. Number one, if you produce excess leptin, if your leptin level is high, you have sick fat cells. Okay. Your fat cells aren't giving the right signal. Okay. Uh, and we got and and what I amazingly find is that over that eighteen to twenty four month period, that leptin gets better too. Right. I actually see that improve when we use a ketogenic diet. So that so the body's ability to heal the fat cells actually gets better, yeah. um, and Dr. Uh, Bray actually coined the term uh, adiposopathy, which is sick fat cells. Okay. So that's a yeah. term that's out there in the, in the textbooks now, um, and I agree with that. It's actually it, I actually see that clinically. I'm look that up now. Okay, it's really cool. <laughs> uh, the fascinating part about leptin, though, is that you would theoretically think, okay, if I stop putting fat in the fat cells and I'm losing weight, I'm going to be hungry all the time, but yeah. I'm not. Okay. Well, yeah. fat in and of itself stimulates fullness. So if you, the fat, the, the triglycerides and the, and the, the key, ketones mm -hmm. stimulate part of your brain to stop eating, and leptin stimulates part of your brain to stop eating. But what you have to understand with the fat cell, and this is the part that the calorie theory misses, mm -hmm. is that fat just doesn't go in and sit in the fat cell. Um, our fat cells are kind of like change purses. Mm -hmm. So if I eat fat, fat's going in and coming out continuously. It's cycling. And my personal opinion, although there's no science to prove this, is that that cycling keeps leptin at a normal level. Okay. And if this, if, they, if mm -hmm. it goes up too fast, leptin increases. Mm -hmm. If it goes down too fast, leptin increases. But if you have fat cycling through the, through the system, mm -hmm. that leptin regulates mm -hmm. and the ability of the fat cell to improve regulates. And that's, Theory from Dr. Al. Like that. That's I my like theory. That. Now nobody's proved that, but that's <laughs> but that's kind of what I see yeah. clinically. Okay. Um, and and somehow this this body regulation set point is affected by that. We don't really know how yeah. yet. Yeah. But that but, and that's being researched. But that's kind of the leptin component. But I use leptin. You know, I have a lot of patients that will go on a low-carb diet. The doctor and I are still rabbits and hungry. Mm -hmm. Well, I check their leptin. Leptin is way high. Okay. Leptin is also inhibited by telling the brain that you're full. When you have the presence of high triglycerides okay. and you have the presence of fructose. And this was in your blog. In the blogs, like yeah. That. yeah. So this part is what I often see. So the first time when somebody comes back to me and says, hey, doc, I've been doing a ketogenic diet, but I'm still starving and I'm not losing weight. Yeah. Well, the first thing I check is their leptin. If their leptin's high, I ask two questions. Are you eating fruit? And they go, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I have to, do, I have to take that out too. So <laughs> that's often the culprit. Okay. And then. Um, I watch their triglycerides really closely. If their triglycerides are over 100, that higher triglyceride also inhibits the ability of leptin across the body barrier. Okay. So you won't get the signal crack. Uh -huh. And a number of things other than insulin, well, actually, insulin drives triglyceride, but a number of things other than sugar alone will stimulate that insulin to make triglyceride. Okay. Certain sweeteners do it. Yeah. Uh, creamers and coffee do it. Um, stress, stress does like cortisol. Yeah. 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 So a number of things can drive that process and keep that leptin from signaling the brain that you're full, okay. even though you're doing a ketogenic diet. And so that's the other component that you need to be watching or sh should be mm -hmm. watched in my perspective that helps with leptin. 
Um, you know, it's another one of those hormones. You gotta watch. It's all hormonal. Yeah, that's yeah. where is it caloric? No, it's hormonal. Yeah, yeah. And so come back so, to that question. So I'm guessing then that more fat for those people, at least you know, until they can get things like more fat to help signal, help help their leptin signals, help with the fat signaling theory. Exactly. So yeah, so or, so in those anyway. patients, we increase the fat number one, yeah. and then number two, we look at the environmental factors that may be raising their yeah. triglycerides. Yeah. That maybe you know what 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 may be driving your insulin up other than sugar, yeah. uh, and are there other things you know sleep and stress and um, um, you know uh, a, number, a whole slew of other environmental factors that may be playing a role in in causing that sick fat cell not to send the signals yeah. or be receiving the signals correctly. If that makes sense. Well, that it just reminds me of a, a funny discussion I had with some friends that are <clears throat> doing ketogenic, and we had this. Discussion of I don't are, have you ever had any training like sales or marketing where there's these terms of FIFO and LIFO it's first in first out yeah. and last in last uh -huh. out like whether you you know in a grocery store you want to sell the old stuff first right yeah so we were talking about like well are fat cells LIFO or FIFO like you know is the fat that I'm getting to now is that like ten year old fat or is that you know is it fresh because maybe you've had people experience this as well whereas every once in a while they might have like a, a detox symptom. You know, like that—that that toxins being stored in their fats is being flushed out. Um, well, they actually radio labeled fat. Okay. And, oh. they, and there's a couple okay. studies, and I don't remember them right offhand, but they radio labeled fat, and that—and that's where the coin purse theory comes yeah. into play, okay. is because we watched fat move in and out of these fat cells okay. all over the entire body, and oh. they radio labeled fat. So just because you ate it here doesn't mean it's not going to be burned off. It's going to go to your toe and then back here. So it actually moves. So those, oh. that triglyceride is moving, um, and so the the the. Uh, the only time I really see people really detox and see a, uh, a release of that toxin is in the initial ketogenic diet uh, approach. You know, when they first begin to use fat as their fuel and they're mobilizing a lot of more, a lot more fat than they normally would, yeah. that's when I see those happen. Okay. Once they start to fat adapt and they, they start cycling that fat through mm -hmm. the system as their main fuel source, I don't see that happening. Then they get the skin glow, right? The, uh, yeah, the, the <laughs> wonderful glow of skin and all that. Yeah, all that. Good yeah. ketosis stuff. Yeah. Well, that is that is really cool. Like I learned a lot from you, and uh, I so appreciate you oh, sitting with me and inter you know answering my questions and taking the time out of your schedule to meet with me. And um, I so my clients also were asking about how how does this tele tele patient tele clinic stuff that you do work? So for example, I have some people in Seattle that want to. You know, they've got these leptin issues or something else that's not quite working. They've been following keto and it's not quite working. How can they work with you remotely? Well, that and that's one of the things that I've been trying to pilot. Um, insurance doesn't really want to cover telemedicine um, yeah. in, in a lot of cases. And so right now it's a cash-based pro process. But basically what they do is they, they log into my website, sign up. Okay. Um, they're going to get two emails, one from me directly um, on, on kind of some basics on how to log in. Um, and then they'll actually get a link to the software and how to install the software. Um, the software runs off of a... a, a, a a program um, that is HIPAA compliant and, and secure, uh, and it, it's basically two pieces of software that company combined into one, and it allows uh, you to use your iPhone or your iPad, um, and so it's a video conferencing through okay. um, some software that allows me to would be either at the office or at home or off of my iPhone, and they can be the same at the same place, and we can a video conference that way. Um, so basically, it's a it's a cash based. Uh, approach okay. to allowing patients who don't have access to a, a, a ketogenic specialist somewhere nearby that can get access to me and we can talk about their diet and nutrition and things like that. So, um, do you have a long waiting list for that? Or? You know, it, I've got patients that log in, um, and, and I think uh, the challenge has been most people uh, want their insurance to cover it, oh, and it doesn't, okay. so that's been the biggest challenge. But I've got patients that log in and we do it, um, and it's just a, you know, it's kind of a fee for service issue, so yeah. you know, they pay a fee for each time that they log in with me and things like that. Okay. Um, and that seems to work really well. Just on a long waiting list there. Okay. Um, I've got patients that do log in and want to log in. The, the biggest challenge is that I have to do that outside the other normal time I see patients in clinic. So it's usually, you know, when I'm free to do a, a session, it's usually going to be either at my lunch time or my later in the evening. And it just has to coordinate with their schedule. Okay. So that's one of the things that we find. So. And you can order labs then? Like if, you know, back um, uh, uh, So or? I can actually write a lab order for them okay. and then we can send that to anywhere they need to have. Okay. Uh, and they can actually do the labs. Now the challenge is whether they're Insurance will cover yeah. me or those labs, and that's one of the challenges that often arises because okay. if because I'm licensed in Arizona, but but I'm not licensed in other states, yeah. and so um, you know, whether the your insurance will pay for my order in that state is probably unlikely. So they may end up paying cash for that, and that's often a limiting factor for a lot of people. Is they go well, um, but if they've had the labs ordered and they want to you know remote with me and have me console on those labs and give them some direction, then I'll throw yeah. it to.
So. Well, yeah, and I think that there's, especially a lot of my clients I'm working with, they're already working with a naturopath and yeah. maybe doesn't have the experience. And so if you tell them, hey, try these labs, they probably would coordinate with that and then yeah. their insurance would actually cover that. Maybe cover it or make it up for that, yeah. So yeah. But I can, I, I'm happy to consult and give direction on, hey, try this, try this, and switch this and see how that yeah. works. And that often helps. So. Yeah, well, that's exciting. Yeah. Fun. Yeah. It's kind of the cutting edge stuff. It's, yeah. I, I like the cutting edge technology and this is one of those ways to, you know, not a lot of people are offering it, but I, I see this as one of the futures of, of how medicine is, you know, working. That Pretty is. soon we'll have that Star Trek thing where we just wave it over and it says, <laughs> hey, your weapon's off. Uh, we're not quite there yet. That's so. your genes, right? Exactly. Exactly right. Very true. All right. Well, I just want to thank you again. I really appreciate yeah. meeting you and getting nice to talk you. with you. And uh, I, I, uh, I don't have a good closing or anything, but uh, I'm no. glad I got the voice. The you got to hear, you got to hear, yeah, you got to hear the voice. <laughs> and this has been great to interview you. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Well, thanks for everyone sure. for watching, and uh, we'll see you later. Bye. Thank you much.